free. Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Uh, you click onto the website and it will give you by community. Like you just click, it'll, you click to Northrow, and it will give you home care folks and assisted livings and professionals. It'll give everything that you would hear. Very very local. This is really really local. That is their goal. And as I say, they, and, you know, they're not charging for anything. These are your tax dollars at work, right? So don't feel bad about calling. They like to have you call. As a matter of fact, they really like to ha to know if you have a person who, or are a person, who is in early stages of dementia, so that you can kind of sign on, so that you can be part of their program, really get a maybe a few hours of service if you want to help you know, with, with stuff around the house. And that way they can kind of help you later on as programs, the program goes on. So it's very, very friendly. And their, op their main office is right on Route 20 in, uh, in Marlboro. So they are very close, OK? Uh, a couple of things. So what, is that we're going to talk about the money a little bit. So, if Mary uh, wants to qualify for either of those two programs, the Frail Elder Waiver or the Personal Care Attendant Program, uh, once again, she cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, in that case, though, can have unlimited assets. Unlimited assets. So going back to the strategy, the nursing home strategy, Mary can shift everything to Frank. Frank doesn't have to do another thing. He keeps the house. He keeps all the money. He doesn't have to cash in his IRA or anything else. And Mary can qualify for these programs. There is, there is an income limit above which um, you need to pay a deductible in order to qualify for this program. But there is a myth that there is actually a flat income limit beyond which you just don't qualify. That's not true. If you, the, the, the limit is three times, is 300% of the federal poverty level, which of course moves around with time. The current magic number is $2,154. It's $2,153 and some change. So it's, tr it's actually, two th excuse me, $2,164, right? Um, and, if, and Mary, of course, is below that. So she could qualify for these programs right off the bat just by shifting these assets. Frank would be above that if he needed to qualify. So he would have to pay a deductible. But the, and the deductible is substantial. It is the difference between your income and, if you're in the PCA program, approximately $1,173. So in Frank's case, where he makes about $2,200, um, he would be needing to pay monthly um, a, a medical, a, he would have to be buying uh, medical services, which could include these home care services, equaling about $1,100 a month, right? And that's a lot. But this program wouldn't be used unless Mary had really serious issues, right? So I guess as opposed to thinking of the deductible as being this huge, no, and once again, in Mary's case, it wouldn't apply. But if Frank needed to qualify, that's how much he'd have to pay. But, but I guess the way to think about this is not to be saying, oh my god, that's a really a big deductible, which in this case, if Frank were in, would be about um, you know, $1,200 a month. But rather to say, oh, as, instead of paying privately for home care, which might be 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, you know, 50 hours a week times 4.3 is how many, much? About uh, 200 and some odd hours a month times what in home care? $20, $25 an hour. So now we're talking some serious money. As opposed to that, right, being able to know that once you get, once Frank got to $1,100 a month, everything else is going to get covered by Mass Health. That's a big deal. It really can help people stay home. I just had somebody who qualified for both of the programs, the PCA program and the Frail Elder Waiver. The total number of hours she'll be getting at home from those two programs is over 40 hours a week. So it's a, it's a big deal, and it can really help um, Mary be able to stay at home, right? Now, uh, if she, so she, we need to shift all the assets to Frank. The only other thing, once again, that Frank would want to do in that case is change his will. Because once again, if he died and Mary inherited all the assets, now she's at home and she's got all these assets and she's not going to qualify. She's going to have to spend everything down. Um, whereas if Frank has, has changed his will and shifted the assets, when he dies, all the assets are going to be safe. And Mary, um, perhaps with the help of Mary Jr., is going to stay at home. Let me mention in that context that this PCA program, the Personal Care Attendant Program, 
uh, through which MassHealth will pay the person that you want, the person that you hire, uh, although they'll have someone manage the hiring stuff for you, to do your assistance with the activities of daily living. You can hire your daughter. You could hire Mary Jr. in this case, right? Um, there's an additional program or an alternative program called Caregiver Homes through which if your daughter is living with you or if you've moved in with your daughter, right, um, MassHealth will pay your daughter um, basically to be a foster child as opposed to being typically the foster parent who's taking care of the little kid. You're like the foster child who is taking care of the parent. That's why it's called adult foster care. And they'll pay the, ki the child to take care of the parent, not a gigantic amount, but up to around seventeen dollars or $18,000 a year, all tax-free. All tax-free. Um, so once again, there may be a way that that's not going to solve all problems, but it may be a way to supplement the costs of otherwise taking care of Mary. So there are ways to be doing it. Um, so the real question, if you are if you're trying to figure this out is, once again, if you're Frank and Mary, you really prefer, you want to stay home. You really want to stay home. And I always tell my clients, I said, that's a great alternative, you know, as long as you're really safe, right? Because now Mary's got late, later stages of dementia, so she's got some issues. She's having some physical issues, right? As well as having memory issues. And she may be drifting away she may be falling down. There's a lot of things. And, and you know, the worst thing that could happen to Mary now is for her to break her hip, right? Fall down, break her hip, go to the hospital. We all know where this goes, right? So the question is, can she physically stay there? And is it the place that will make Mary the most happy? The mo now, I, that, I mean, that sounds kind of strange. I, but let me put it this way. When I, was, when I started doing this kind of work, I really came into this well, once again, it was kind of before people called it Alzheimer's disease, and we really kind of talked about this back in 1991. My mother was in the nursing home in 1991. She died in the nursing home. So back then, none of this stuff kind of existed. Um, but as I got to know about Alzheimer's, I assumed that Alzheimer's, there were a set of symptoms of Alzheimer's that you always associate with Alzheimer's, right? There's, there's, there's memory loss. There is having trouble following directions associated with memory loss. There's getting lost right, associated with memory loss. There are a whole thing, bunch of things associated with this cognitive thing that happens, memory loss. And, but then there are all these other things that you also associate with this. Anger, depression, apathy, right, all these really intense emotions, which I had always assumed were simply part of the disease, but which I have really come to appreciate are really these secondary symptoms. They are the reaction of the person to the embarrassment or the frustration or the, all of the stuff that has to do with the memory loss. So the question is, can you be in a place where, although your memory ain't so hot, you're still happy? You're still happy. Because the goal of life isn't necessary to be, necessarily to be able to do the New York Times crossword puzzle. You know, I mean, I can't do it, right? My wife does. She'll be very upset when she can't do it anymore. But that, does that define you, right? So one of the interesting things about memory care units, and this has been, you know, as, as Julie mentioned, this is kind of a new evolution in assisted living about, about memory care units, is they have really been developed over time as a way to provide an environment in which a person who may have mid or late stage Alzheimer's can be happy um, th through a variety of techniques right, that have to do with really understanding Alzheimer's care. Now, we are, we are fortunate in that the Salmons, who own the Beaumonts and the Whitney Places uh, of this world, have been really kind of in the forefront of trying to develop memory care units. I asked Trish Pope, uh, who it works right here in uh, Northboro at Whitney Place, to talk to you a little bit about that and about the memory, about, about the concept kind of behind the memory care unit when you think it might be appropriate to think about it and what it is that makes it special. And as you're hearing about that, I also want you to think about it in the context of if you were staying at home because you didn't think it was, you were quite ready for the memory care unit yet, um, how that would work at home. What kinds of people you would want to have taking care of Mary, if you're Frank, right? Or if you're Mary Jr. What, or Frank, what you need to know about this stuff, right? 
in order to, that Mary can be happy. Her memory's not coming back, but that she can be happy. So Trish, can we talk a little bit about the memory care units? 